Okay, so hi, I am Chelsea. I sent you that weird uh, PDF of links and uh, I heard that a couple of them didn't work. Um, I think it's because I pulled them out of the Medium Android app rather than from you know a Medium web website. So uh, so we'll cover anything anything that was not accessible or even that you just didn't get time to get to. We'll touch on that and I'll kind of give a TLDR of what that source was for, like why I provided it. But uh, first, I wanted to explain this this strange basement that we find ourselves in, that I find myself in most of my week. Uh, this is uh, Decontrol Community Commons. Uh, it's been here for more than three years, and it originally started, uh, two uh, fellas, uh, Freddie and Cam, started it so that um, they could have a place to go talk about Bitcoin where they didn't have to pay for coffee. <laughs> and that was, and ever since then, for its entire existence, it's just been a non-hierarchical collective where we all split the rent. Like, we pay in, we co-own this place, we have 24-7 access, and we got a lot of cool shared resources. But the mo main focus has been, and the main draw to it is, uh, being totally crazy about decentralization and blockchain tech and stuff like that. Um, we have a lot of art activities and stuff like that in the space too, but it's very much been, uh, it's been kind of a beacon, I feel like, for uh, the rising blockchain scene here and for a lot of political stuff that's around, okay, how can we make sure our systems are participatory and like actually work, you know, how do we fix the broken system of larger government that just seems to be getting worse and worse with uh, globalization. So um, it is technically a clubhouse. And for a while, I've been around for two years, and for a while I was pushing of like, oh no, but let's also make it like an above the board venue and stuff, and like make more official things. And I've come around to realize it's really cool just as a clubhouse. Like we play ping pong here, we chat, and we mostly have evening events that are free to the public. And that kind of protects its nerdiness a bit, like because we've never gone paid event or anything like that, because the, uh, we got a couple little leaks, things like that. You may notice it's, a, it's got charm. <laughs> and I really feel, um, after having traveled uh, for about four months this year and seeing a lot of the rest of the world's blockchain scenes, uh, well, not really that much, but having been through Europe and some of the states and stuff like that, there are so many awesome things going on, but this is kind of like the protected little, I don't know, it's, it, we're, we're still in slumber here. It's just a bunch of friends hanging out in Vancouver in general, like even the more formal stuff. So that's why I think Vancouver is really the seat of the governance and human culture side of blockchain. Because there are already hubs that, have lo that are like focused on financial technology. You know, there are wall streets of blockchain now and cryptocurrency. But they're really, I, I've been surprised at the dearth of enclaves that are solely focused outside of academic institutions on mindfully deciding what it is we're trying to design together and talking about how is this implemented, what's realistic. You know, you can't just invent cool tech tools and hope that humans will behave exactly the way thought they would, because <laughs> we've seen that go wrong time and time again. I've been trying to popularize the term uh, the Oppenheimer effect. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Oppenheimer, a uh, physicist who famously said, I am become death, destroyer of worlds, when he realized that his zooming in on a cool little tech problem led to creating a destructive bomb, which the United States wielded pretty evilly, in my opinion. Um, some would talk war strategy, but essentially the engineering mindset, um, like the artistic mindset, like when you get in the vibe for painting or something like that, you can get too zoomed into the problem solving slash creation and the little details of how do I get this done? And we need our communities and we need to form really strong uh, opt-in communities to say, should this be done? <laughs> Could it be done in a way that like takes less resources or harms others less, etc.? So I kind of see, um, and I'm not alone in this, and I'm not the originator of the the forewarning of hey, we have to design ethics into our tech systems. But I see this happening a lot around this region. I'm not just like selling Vancouver. I'm not from here originally. I moved here five years ago, and again, I. I I've really kind of fallen in love with the, um, 
it's something about like the BC, uh, the, the BC stop and take a breath sort of lifestyle, like the, the outdoorsishness and stuff, that it seems people really, this has been a bit of a protected um, area from like soul sucking for profit <coughs> ventures. Even the for profits I see rising up in this space are focused on social good and devote a significant amount of their innovation capital or whatever to, okay, how can we solve problems in Africa right now for refugees and stuff like that. So again, it's a super cool scene here. Um, and on, on the housekeeping side of things, if you need to use the bathroom, it is straight down the hall past my finger at the end of the hall under a sign that says cemetery. Like I said, this place has its charms. <laughs> A little quirky. Uh, the trash is out there, and if you need water, you can get some. Uh, there's a sink with cups above it right before uh, the, the bathroom. Chelsea, yes. I don't know if I was sort of getting to some of the things. Have you told people what you're about and why you um, are here? A bit. Not really. Okay. Oh, well, I'm mostly in on the cap of. Right summer. Yeah. Is oh. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> One time. Maybe just provide some context. So for, I. For why you're there? Yeah. 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 Well. Mainly, as I had said, I've been an organizer here for about two years. I've been a lot more hands-on in the past year. Um, but I stumbled in here while I was doing a master's degree in uh, like uh, nonprofit management uh, in 2000. I was finishing it. It was 2014, and my friend Blank Banshee played a DJ set here, and and they never actually were able to play music here again because of the noise from it. But I came in and this was back when they still had Bitcoin mining rigs just made out of like, you cut some plastic crates and then you zip tie all of the parts of a computer there. You can do one for 20 bucks to make Bitcoin. Um, so I walked down here and it's this weird place. And he's like, and I still, I actually stumbled across last year. Um, I had taken pictures and written down notes and they were in my Evernote when I was exporting it. And I'm like, oh my God baby decentral times. <laughs> but um, but I had to finish my master's degree, so I was like, okay, bookmarked, duly noted, I will never finish my degree if I get involved here. Um, and then came back to an intro to decentralization at, like uh, in the summer after that. And I think if I had a attended one of the pure technical, it was mostly like intro to Bitcoin technical talks back then. And I wouldn't have really, you know, it, it's very much an insider's club of like, like mathematical knowledge and development knowledge. It's a bunch of acronyms and stuff. And to be fair, I think academics is like that. You know, like I come from critical theory. I think it's like that too. But very much so with the DERN acronyms in tech that it, the first year that I was hanging out here, I would constantly as a loud mouth American just be like, whoa, 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 okay. We pause and for those of us who don't know, to find the like six acronyms you just said. So it is hard to break into that, um, the, the, that side of things unless, again, you can have an engineering mindset and an artistic mindset. So if you are, if that language makes sense to you, boom, you look all those up, you're in. But uh, luckily the intro to decentralization that I came, came to, uh, led by one of the co-founders, Cameron Gray, um, it actually, he opens with uh, the TED talk that I had put in uh, by Johan Gevers, the four pillars of a decentralized society. So we started the group conversation around, okay, what are the ideal, not what can we do with Bitcoin, but what are the ideal societies we could imagine because of these larger decentralization concepts? And working inward in the design, uh, you, need, you, need, <laughs> you need the detailed people there simultaneously working outward from the design of what are these protocols and how, you know, like, wh what makes them so, uh, so disruptive, really. Um, so yeah, I stuck around, uh, and I'm a bit of a loudmouth advocator, I used to be an activist and stuff, so I... Uh, really have pushed over the years for us to uh, continue to uh, have as much education pushed out into the public as possible for free and make sure that as all of these things become as commonplace, cryptocurrencies and stuff like that become as commonplace as we now find the internet to be, that the public is as ready for that as possible. So that because it would be very easy with a less informed public or with less ethical purposeful design of the tools for 
central players to uh, re-centralize, you know, for the big banks and stuff to just invent their version of a blockchain and be like, here you go, see, it's got that trust stuff they were talking about. So it's, as like awareness is really rising this year and uh, like, yeah, it's been an insane well, year. The, oh, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. So well, first I traveled around Europe uh, to a bunch of different spaces. And I actually uh, took documentary footage there, and I've not had time to touch it at all. But ideally, there will be a little, little fun movie coming out of that. Uh, but uh, more recently, in August, um, I co-led a uh, a theme camp called Camp Decentral at Burning Man, which um, I had never been to Burning Man before, and I did not consider I'm like computer nerd type. I did not consider myself to be a burner because. I had a common misconception that it's about partying and stuff like that, rather than legitimately it is the most, uh, it is the model for decentralization. It's a duocracy where you build a city together. <laughs> and pretty cool. It's, I, I read an academic article that uh, re referred to it as the engineer's vocational ecstasy. So it's a bunch of people getting together to build things exactly how they want them together with their friends and hang out. Um, and to build things that are unlikely to, you know, like to go aspirational. Hey, let's build that 40 feet tall instead, because it's this is your, you know, this is your playground once a year, and there are many regional events of these types and stuff like that. But yeah, so we went there, and I think last year's Burning Man there were 70,000 people apparently. I imagine this year they kept it capped around similar. Um, and we ran a 37 lecture series uh, in a dome. In uh, we were part of uh, uh, I always say it wrong Asahana Village, I believe, which is like the free university of the of the playa. And it was really interesting because we had our one decentralized dome, and then there were uh, three domes for Naked Heart, which is like the eroticism embodied awareness, like tantra workshops and stuff. And then three from Keep Contact, which is like acrobatic dance and stuff. It was beautiful to see the interplay between the people just wandering in and out. Um, but uh, yeah, we got a, a huge response to that, um, and it was it was just really great to see. Um, and and about forty of us lived together as Camp Decentral to pull that off. And it was some of the folks. Uh, I must admit that I put the stuff, uh, the links to uh, the, uh, explaining the DAO. And then the white hat hackers um, in there because they're buddies of mine and they were at the camp and I bring them up as an example uh, of true trustless trust of like when you're not even going to benefit not just yourself but your loved ones and you truly believe code is law. Um, but I can get into that with the I have a, a breakdown of themes that we can discuss from this. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was great to see all of these. It seemed it, I, I feel like. We got a ton of people who were really idealistic about this culture layer, this philosophy layer, and we really did just for two weeks straight like talk about this stuff all the time. That's why I've st we started all recording things and making shared collaborative documents and stuff because we're like, let's not lose it. Let's really ideate this and design some sort of, we're looking at designing something with uh, some form of universal basic income an opt-in system, um, I think something our generation desperately needs, uh, especially, is the idea of in this new coming age, labor is going to be, you know, completely, you know, like if we enter into a world where many things are automated, there is no reason we can't figure out how to build opt-in distributed resource systems in a decentralized way where we could all do our passion during the day and then do a m small amount, you know, like you earn credits through uh, mechanical turp like labor or something like that. So very early on, but the big vision is number one uh, vision for decentralists right now, myself included, I'd say, is how do we create a sustainable world where everyone has their basic, like, like beyond their basic human rights, where everyone has, uh, there's the, in Canada, I'm trying to remember what it's called, um, there's a really good framework, for, uh, the Canadian Social Determinants of Health Framework says that beyond needing food and uh, shelter and stuff like that, we also need community contact. We need opportunities to learn, etc. So just the idea that we could build, uh, we could build a world like that where we have smaller opt-in nodes. 
that have our own agreements. Because the reason that it never works doing it in a centralized way is my utopian commune is very different from one of yours, I presume. So this works on, uh, like decentralists believe that this works on smaller scale. Um, I believe it's they, there's Dunbar's number is the number at which anonymity becomes possible in a society. Below that, when people know each other face to face and when you're making communal decisions face to face, it's a lot harder to get, to, to stop treating someone else like a human being, the way we see in large scale, like look at discourse about politics online right now. That's not, when you are part of a small face-to-face -face community that you opted into, and you're there because you want to be, and there's opportunities to exit that node and go to another one with a different agreement, the, the, the hope and dream here is that that would enable people to just take their ball and go play somewhere else, rather than for people to be like, the system has to be exactly how I say it, and we will argue and never accomplish anything until we get, you know, like the standstills we get, the face-offs of this. So, anyways, um, my passion's around that. I run events. Uh, I like doing like uh, conference ops management because I like. I didn't really like conferences because for a long time because I didn't know what to do with my set. You know, I'm just like. Bleh. But if your job literally involves like running and diving for things and Instagramming everything and shit, like I felt. I don't know. It makes me feel more connected to the speakers and stuff. Uh, like when I. And I'm, just, I'm like, I'm actually intentionally listening to you even though I really should be doing this. So it's embedded me in, uh, the, in a bit of the global blockchain scene. There's so much going on that there's no way to be present at everything. Um, and I personally don't care too much for the financial technology side of it. I still think a huge amount of it's pretty corrupt and it makes me uncomfortable when people are just like, I didn't put much in the readings about uh, initial coin offerings and the whole thing in blockchain of right now everyone's making their own coin for things. It's on, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos uh, said it very well recently, it's simultaneously true that initial coin offerings are a glimpse of a radical new type of fundraising that will probably be the norm as opposed to, you know, like how you have to go to investors right now and like very, a couple very rich people and convince them of your idea. 20 years from now, ICOs, it's kind of like kickstarting, like it's, it's going to be a thing. But it is also true that with current, the current wave of this that's bringing so much attention to our scene, I, he said, not, I think he said, I don't want to misquote him, 99.9% .9 of them will turn out to be bullshit <laughs> and people will lose money. And they, it's, it's a mad free-for-all in terms of the financial side of things. And I've never had a good instinct for finance either. I was getting paid in Bitcoin for two years and I was always, I had to sell to pay my rent and I'm always like, now. <laughs> and then we just like go up $300 the next day and stuff. So I just stay well away from that. Um, it is something where I, uh, Again, we have all of these strong ideals about building like a system in which our entire, everyone in this room can live comfortably and pursue their dreams uh, financially. That's as a backup plan, um, learning a little bit about crypto uh, investing, if you have proven to have like math and finance skills and logic like that, that is a reasonable way for, to ensure you, like as an artist, you could support yourself just independently. We have numerous members of the community who made millions of dollars in crypto. So I'm, I'm not one of them, but, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a very generous scene is what I like. And that is something that I think steers the FinTech away from Wolf of Wall Street style, um, is that um, uh, just as I attempted to praise Vancouver's general tech scene as having a social good, a, a purported social good focus, in general, crypto, crypto investors um, will give a lot to uh, social good causes because most of them are very, they're either an, an, an caps like anarchist capitalists or uh, libertarians or uh, m most of the people who made a lot of money in it and are very vocal in the scene believe that the free market should handle social good problems rather than, a, than government programs. And they're, unlike I've seen in most of that, you know, like most traditional finance, they're actually putting their money where their mouth is and saying, oh, I just made all this money, so I'm going to go cure this problem. Like, so it is pretty good. 
in that regard. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the things I was kind of going to link into a lot of the a lot of the reading and a lot of the link ups with uh, game theory is that I come from a background and a context, uh, I was super liberal arts schools, um, that was highly critical of capitalism. I still feel pretty critical of capitalism. However, I wouldn't purport that cryptocurrency enthusiasts, or that most of us, believe that capitalism is good, just that it is the easiest economic structure to plot out and protect for in game theory. That's the thing, capitalism is game theory for resources. And the mathematics in cryptocurrency and the sorts of the ways that uh, these protocols were designed to ensure that it takes more effort on your part to try to rip the system off than you would get back from the system are basically founded on classical like math ethics problems, but also on, uh, on game theory. So, and that's not, I can't break it down. It, it, I would say again, kind of giving, trying to give the broad view so that if any of these linked fields interest you, game theory being another one, like go learn about that element of this. Because there is a lot of room to be an early innovator and even just an early contributor of, you know, like, like some of what I do that I think is actually pretty productive these days is just comment in intense conversations about this on Facebook and stuff. Like, it's the things we're already doing, yeah. Um, what is game theory? Like, I read all the readings that I think I might have skipped over it or something. Oh, I think uh, it probably wasn't explicitly, sorry, it probably wasn't explicitly outlined in there, but it's referred to in a lot, in like a couple of the first <coughs> longer things. Like, the idea of game theory is an attempt to map out logically how parties uh, behave in their own best interests and how to best design ways in which, well, it depends on your, your intent, but how best to shape systems, and games are like the root symbol here. Because you really see in children playing some basic games with sharing resources and stuff, they're doing the same thing we do on like massive levels in trading. Um, so yeah, game theory is basically a fully established like mathematical uh, field that uh, like math theory, philosophy of math, if you will, um, that looks at how uh, how people will behave given certain conditions of a system, um, and it kind of links into to me. I, I actually have trouble defining the where like game theory's influence ends and like more of the ethics elements of uh, the design of cryptocurrency, uh, well the de design of like uh, ciphers, cryptographic ciphers in general is, um, it's all pretty gamey, like when you look at also like designing ciphers, it's just like puzzles linking up complexly different, you know, like coding things. The, the, co the encoder ring sort of thing from the cereal box. So it's stuff like that. It's ge and I've generally found that people who get really into those areas tend to really play there. Like they're, they're, having, they're having sort of, uh, they're fleshing out um, an exploration of, so what is even possible? When you take it out of like sociology studies, what people have done and are doing. The game theory is like, okay, we strip it down to, Pretend there's no specific context to this, except for whatever uh, variables or interests we had assigned to person A in this. So, I don't know. Krishna, do you know any more about the game theory? You, it seems like it would be your jam. Game yeah. theory? Yeah. Um, this is Krishna and Kenza, they're my friends here, they're super cool. Sorry, not to hail you unnecessarily. It's usually kind of stemmed out of the Cold War, so that's kind of the beginning. So, uh, from my understanding, yeah. uh, I took a he called it game theory class at university. But oh, cool. I, I I disagree with everything in game theory, uh, so, yeah, because I think it's uh, not everything can be used to logic, and uh, uh, you know you had mathematicians like John Nash who were the provers creating the Nash equilibrium, mm -hmm. and these are all just. From a military structural sense, I, I can appreciate game theory. Yeah. In economic sense, I did it. Yeah. But but I do believe within the spectrum of uh, cryptocurrency, the foundation, how it how it, it works with game theory, then it kind of makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, to me, what it does is, I mean, the, the game theory elements to cryptocurrency, they are forming that, like, what code is law means as a, as a belief system, if you will. The idea, the people who are really just dedicated to blockchain tech say, code is law, whatever happens after we execute a smart contract or a transaction, that's what we agreed to happen, because the math is there. Uh, code is law arises from, I think, a pretty, it seemed cynical to me at first, but it's actually pretty protective of, okay, so if we just treat every player with distrust from the beginning and build a system that doesn't allow us to, you know, like, to mess with it, then we have a lot more room to play with really trusting each other and trying things. And that's the, that's my whole, like, that's why I am really embedded in this space, is I do believe the structures, they seem kind of cold. Like, if you look at Satoshi's white paper with Bitcoin, it's, uh, and then you think about, like, I don't know, for us, most of our transactions with Bitcoin are amongst people we know face to face and, like, interfacing with this space. So it's really funny that, the exceptional level of trustability of this code is not necessary for us, <laughs> but by building a system in which all players entering and exiting have that same sort of, I don't know, it feels sort of protective to me. Uh, then, we can, then we can attend to higher level things. And to me, it's a parallel to the whole idea of, holy crap, we need universal basic income or something in the next 20 years, because that sort of system, like economic structures, if we set them into place so they can autonomously function pretty well, that gives us the space and the higher level of attending to our art, attending to our relationships and friendships. Or, for many technologists I know, attending to other cool tech projects and building the next ones, you know? So, um, we're gonna see. And I'd encourage anybody that is actually interested in game theory to actually, this is a good research topic in terms of game theory as it applies to culture and whether it holds it, you know, are we rational players, that sort of thing. Right? So it's actually a really interesting place. If you, I don't know if any of you remember um, one of the first computer things was, um, was a movie called War Games, right? You remember, it's a really old, something like I think in the 80s or 70s something. And it was basically this computer that was playing games, but it didn't know that um, that actually what it was doing. It actually started playing with real nuclear missiles. It didn't. It sort of got confused, right? It was an artificial. So they turned it on, and it had the control of the U.S. system. And then the Soviets, in that case, also had one. And so these two computers were about to just launch and destroy the world. And then one of the uh, then this hacker kid. Um, basically, through playing tic-tac-toe, uh, taught the uh, the AI that it was a zero-sum game. In other words, there were no, there was no way to win this if you if you executed this game. So zero-sum games, non-zero-sum games, um, binary. These are all kinds of mathematical models that can also have applications in economic theory. And there's a really great book, which I was going to save as a secret, but which was going to get be your last little gift, which is a uh, little PDF that I was going to send to you, um, which you'll get on the last day of class, um, is actually was game theory. In fact, this entire course is designed around game theory. <laughs> That's the underlying architecture. So um, I had to get that on the last day. <laughs> so that was, was that kind of like what the, the game was about as well on the required thing? Yeah. 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 So must put that for about an hour. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. something that has been zooming around. It's actually really interesting. The trust game that has been zooming around like all of the social networks I'm a part of and interestingly hitting different social media platforms at different times in the past, I'd say, month or something, but people at all levels of like the blockchain nerd gang, you know, up to the people who are getting interviewed, you know, by newspapers on this stuff are like, oh my god, this is an adorable, amazing little project and it teaches about trust in a way that no article can do justice to. Like, it's, I, I really like that project. I actually was hoping to uh, reach, and once I put that on there, I was like, I'm gonna reach out to that artist and see if we can beam, I believe, uh, Forget who they were, but beam them into uh, uh, to, to decentral because we like to beam people in and ask them about their projects and stuff. And it's like that's a super fun thing. Like, well, one of the things we really need to design is the interface level for teaching these things to the public and teaching them like why this could be revolutionary. Because as I said earlier, 
the big banks are going to want to, you know, uh, like like the major banks would like to swing the ooh security. This is all about security, and we can do that for you too. So this crypto revolution just come come to all you just have to keep your account. It's easy, you know. Whereas if we lose the element of trustless trust and no intermediary can take your your value away from you. Uh, then people will be like, oh, my bank emailed me. Oh, I have been hearing about this Bitcoin stuff. Okay, I'll add, uh, you know, TD coin or whatever <laughs> and start using that. So there's a, there's a chance, and I think because of the internet and the sphere it's created for many-to-many -many communication, I think we're pretty good, but we still have to be wary of the possibility that there would be a missed opportunity here for this revolutionary protocol to get drowned out by some sort of uh, corporate faking of it. Um, so that's what, again, encourages uh, spaces like this to do a lot of just like we do, I'd say now we're up to uh, four intro meetups a month, uh, and they're always full house. We actually just bought new chairs, well, actually a member donated new chairs, we were going to buy them. Um, and yeah, so attention is growing. There's also, of course, the, um, the uh, the visual, music, uh, media, multimedia art side to this. Like we need the minds of artists and designers for the systems, but it's also a really thriving scene for uh, for art. And there is uh, October twenty seventh. Uh, it looks like I'm going to be going to the second uh, Ethereal Summit. Um, Ethereum being one of the one of the platforms, the two main main chains people are looking at now. Um, and the blockchain company Consensus runs it. Uh, I missed the last one, but it's a completely visual arts focus. It's focused on crypto visual art. Um, so I'm gonna be trying to go and rep Vancouver hard there. And uh, I'm gonna, if they're doing these so frequently, this is like five months after the last one. This is not a full year. So I'm gonna see if we can get one here. That would be really super cool. Um, Cause again, it's it'd be the sort of, uh, the advent of our technologies and how phone in your pocket, constant devices, stuff like that can make a lot of things, it makes a lot of things really easy and convenient. It also makes a lot of it like really loud and deafening and constant. Um, but uh, I think we can do good things with that. And we can, again, set it, it's kind of like a, an idea of like, a group chooses an autopilot agreement for how they will act in any uh, foreseen circumstances. Like, we're a pretty good example of a decentralized autonomous organization. We, and it's made it real, real challenging to run this non-hierarchically. Because over the years, we've had as few rules as possible. I'd say that's a core thing for decentralists, is like, you want to limit struct any sort of like uh, commandeering instruction overall and just uh, just plan for as much autonomy at the lowest level possible of decision making. But because of just going with the oh we'll play it as it lays, any sort of uh, any sort of problem that befalls a common space, we kind of have to invent reinvent the system. Either be like okay we're gonna vote this one time on this one thing or be like okay this one thing say like a ceiling leak has happened for a year now, and we keep voting on them, do we need to build something into our, you know, like, do we need to? Usually for us, it tends to be um, a documentation sort of thing of like, okay, are we going to establish that we always vote to get it fixed, so we should just up to a certain spend get it fixed and have someone uh, duocracy that. Oh. Have, have, have y'all heard of the word duocracy before? So I was told, okay, I, was, I thought it was more common than, uh, than it is, and Kenta actually thought it was made up. Did you ever Google the spelling I told you? Well, it is made up, but <laughs> he thought it did not exist outside of me saying it, but I promise you. Um, it's D-O-O-C-R-A-C-Y, duocracy. Um, and what a duocracy is, this is one, um, and Burning Man is a duocracy. It means if you want to do something, it's usually hopeful that that means something something that contributes to the world rather than smashing it. Um, and it will not violate any agreed upon rules. 
and there's not someone like literally standing in your way who can't move or something, just do it. It's the, uh, it's like a group of, a duocracy is a group of people agreeing ahead of time to consent to um, ask forgiveness rather than uh, permission. Like that, and places like this where nobody lives here but this is a space that needs stuff all the time couldn't thrive without either a paid person or a duocracy, which allows people to be like, oh yeah, that really does need to need to be handled. Um, unfortunately, making a permissive structure for duocracy does not necessarily mean it will thrive. Um, and uh, we've been really excited because for a long time, for like m I've been here more than two years, and at monthly members meetings, we were always talking about how do we solve that. Um, have uh, you all heard of the tragedy of the commons? I'll write that down as well. The tragedy of the commons is exactly what it sounds like. It is interestingly Wikipedia. Okay, well, I'll use Wikipedia as a concrete example here. Interestingly, Wikipedia seems to cope with this pretty well, but the tragedy of the commons is that less than one, one tenth of one percent of people who use Wikipedia contribute to Wikipedia. It's that common shared resources where you don't have forcible rules about you have to work are going to get a slacker effect. They're going to get kind of, it's like the opposite version of this that comes up a lot in cryptocurrency the contributory and like token using version of this is the long tail of participation, which says that interestingly, so, so for Wikipedia, the smallest fraction of people contribute significantly to it. The long tail of the user base shows that the, like the largest amount of people who do contribute, contribute one or two things ever. Like they just saw a typo they couldn't stand anymore and they just, they're like, okay, I, <laughs> I can do this anonymously, great, okay. <laughs> um, so the tragedy of the commons becomes more of a true tragedy when it comes to what hackers call meat space. Real IRL, real life, um, and shared resources and actual sustenance of life, doing chores, stuff like that. So the tragedy of the commons means who shows up and actually does stuff. A very small fraction, often, of a commons. So, and uh, I think I'll like finish this up, and then we can probably take a break, and uh, then we can. I'll turn this off, and we can like converse more. Um, but uh, so we mused upon this meeting after meeting got real annoying we had github issue we, we have like a shared platform where we write okay here's what we want to do to do list anyone um and uh this year one of our members uh, unfortunately he's not able to make it tonight but um uh, one of our members uh taylor started designing he he because i, I think this is i think he'd be fine with me saying this because it's po popular knowledge. He was very smart about, he's, he loves Bitcoin and thinks it's going straight to the moon like many. So he's smart about just gathering some. So he was able to leave his job and just do what he wanted for a while earlier this, uh, this year. Um, I made up a name for it, which was Summer Taylor. <laughs> like every time I'd come in, I'd see him just like hacking around and he had a great time. And in the process of that great time, he built an autonomous accounting system for the space, which interestingly doesn't use all the fancy bells and whistles of a cryptocurrency blockchain. It's just like a protected access database with a web interface that we can go click through. And we all have our, um, our RFID fobs. This is what you'll like swipe a building's uh, door to get in with. We all have unique fobs and we interact with it in that way. And we actually finally just went live using real money with it uh, this past, uh, I think, last week or something. And it's just, just having been around for a while, and then I was traveling the whole time he was doing this, so I didn't really see the minutia. I came back and this thing we had talked about forever was actually built. And it's a really good lesson, I think, for the blockchain craze that's going on right now and just like how much publicity blockchains are getting that he didn't use that <laughs> he didn't because we're a clubhouse there's less than 30 of us we know each other 
we interact with the Bitcoin blockchain only upon exiting our small node, if you will, our accounting system. And the reason for that, the reason you don't want to interact with something with that high level of security is that it costs money and fees and takes a long time. Because for Bitcoin, you're literally having the entire network of people who are mining and using Bitcoin and stuff like that acknowledge, yes, this is a legitimate $3 beer transaction. <laughs> like the whole, you know, it affects the whole ledger. So kind of slows thing, things down. We actually got uh, we got called out on Reddit for it when someone came here and recorded like a video of buying beer for Bitcoin from our from our machine here. They were saying uh, stop clogging up the network because at that point it was having a huge scaling problem. And yeah, and I think we just gotten uh, technology sinks in and you don't pay attention to it anymore. So we've gotten used to it and we're paying attention to the fact that we had like $60 transaction fees on each of those $3. We're just like, oh yeah, buy a beer from ourselves. Oh, great. <laughs> so yeah, so we built this smaller scale. I think it's a, a really good playground for how we start to do this for economies on the larger scale to sustain ourselves. Because it's not just we have our membership credited from it, and uh, we, we also can claim bounties using the RFIDs for tasks that need to be done. You take the trash out and you, yeah. What kind of money do you use for um, It is all the back end, oh hey Mike. Yeah. <laughs> the back end of all of our finances is Bitcoin. Um, and our, uh, but the accounting system is just an internal debit and credit system against your membership. So only if you choose to leave do you settle up. Like basically any sort of payment channel structures like that, including ones that have been officially proposed to solve some of Bitcoin's technical problems, like Lightning Networks have been proposed that, sat, that are very much like what this accomplishes, a group of people, you know, you buy coffee from the same place every day, so you set up a payment channel just between you and them. It functions like a tab basically at a bar. Uh, but a more comp you can do much more complex things than a tab. You can go in both directions, etc. Um, but uh, one of the major things here, I guess, what I like a thought I'd like to uh, close out with before the break is just um, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos' speech recently brought the uh, the collusion between governments and banks into my worldview more than it usually is. Like. I'm usually more looking at the, the self-governance, how do we have opt-in structures where nobody's the king, sort of thing. I'm interested in that. But he had pointed out that increasingly, over the past 40 plus years, um, there have been interesting uh, international, uh, international treaties, etc., under globalization, that make it so that if you don't play ball with the US banking system, in terms of regulations, etc., you lose power as a nation state within the larger uh, within the larger ecosystem globally. Like you get denied privileges. There's been an increasing intertwining of like the surveillance states that, and I speak as an American who's pretty uh, pretty scared of my own country's uh, massive militarized surveillance capabilities and stuff. So so basically. This is a very real problem. It's not just that uh, banks, you know, that banks charge us fees and stuff. It's that it's a whole toxic structure that forces people to play by every single rule of a system where the rule they have no say in those rules. Um, and so it's something that if we, it's it's an out. It's a way to continue to exist in the society we live in, not think we are going to overthrow a nation state, so to speak, but to start to create diversity in the options we have of, uh, available. So like mini exits from the system and just opt outs from playing by those traditional uh, those traditional rules. Um, yeah. um, just to just um, in terms of some of the, the topics that might be of interest and how they fit together. Mm -hmm. um, so we have decentralization. How, maybe you can just speak a bit to how peer-to-peer fits into that concept, how open source uh, working, you know, things like Wikipedia, you've sort of touched on it, but just maybe how these things fit together as a philosophy and as a uh, ethos. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, peer-to-peer, 
peer-to-peer -peer production, like collaborative production, and um, well, just fell out of my head. Okay. And open source, and open source, uh, the open source philosophy behind uh, the origins of modern computing, both fit really well with with uh, probably the larger curriculum and the direction that uh, Emily Carr students are going in. I would hope because it's all about creation. It's all that is where you know, like we look at the hard tech side of, and I, like when I read a white paper, my eyes still kind of start to cross at the beginning. Like the the super technicalities of like math based engineering and stuff. Um, I often I, 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 I now I'll just zoom in and be like, okay, what's being created here? Where's the creation in this? Because that's a language I understand. Is like what's what's being born out of this white paper. Um, so, uh, open source uh, philosophy is essentially, well, it was originally free and open source <coughs> philosophy. And we were discussing last night just how, how funny it is that it's so explicitly dropped the free because it's confusing if you want to make money. <laughs> so it's like capitalism has had its way with what was once just free software when Richard Stallman originally came up with the concept. But what it means uh, is free as in freedom, not free as in beer. It may be free as in no money but all free or open source software has the code to recreate it, mess around with it, create your own version of it, uh, publicly available. Um, and there may be monetizations of that, but ultimately open source means creating a collaborative code base that we can all swap each other's code and try it out. Um, one of the, actually it's funny, I, I hadn't really brought this in while thinking about uh, this class, but. One of the jokes that came up at Decentral was fork everything. We actually spray painted that on the side of one of the tents. It's fork everything. Because forking in open source software development means to take someone's code, make a copy of it, and you f to fork it, you now switch from there, you know, like you don't try to alter their version. You just create your own version starting from that exact, mo it's not starting from scratch, and it's not starting from scratch like looking at someone's blueprints. It's saying, okay, I'll take this, now I'll remix it. Like the art version would be remixing or you know, collage and <laughs> stuff like that. Like pulling, because once you start, you can even get into pulling patches from different people's codes, and then you're no longer forking, you're like putting together a new Frankenstein's monster. But the whole point around all of this is something that, um, I mean, I, I make uh, music videos and I like to use other people's footage. Like I like to shoot some footage, but I really like remixing footage. Um, and it's a similar thing that I find within that realm and that we find in arguments around audio remixes and stuff is the people arguing on behalf of things like Creative Commons licensing and public access to remix stuff have the same argument as open source advocates, which is we have so like exponentially larger pools of innovation available if we can use other, be like, oh, that gave me this idea, boom. Like that is kind of how creation has always worked. Can't think of, I, I can't picture a world in which there was not first art that you were going, thinking you had in the back of your head. Um, and then um, for the infrastructure, of peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking, the easiest way to conceptualize it is um, torrenting files. Like when you're torrenting a file, you download the magnet link that directs uh, your torrenter or your torrent client to uh, connect to many of your peers. And depending upon which portions of the file, because some of them are not, they're not, they don't have the whole file, they're also downloading it and you're simultaneously sending uh, pieces of what you have out. So you're just, because of how complex and advanced technology is now, whether it's uh, torrenting files or cryptocurrency records, computers can simultaneously hold the complex map of what the file should, what every bit of the file should be, and plug in different parts of it. Like it doesn't have to go from, I'm, I'm 30, so I started downloading music when you did have to just get connect to one person and it downloaded from the beginning of the file to the end, and that took a lot longer. Like I remember like in the 90s being like, come on, no, I'm on dial-up, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but um, so, so the peer-to-peer -peer capabilities of, or, or I mean the peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure underneath cryptocurrency and the way cryptocurrency is mined and tracked and exchanged that's what ensures that it can never be targeted or controlled. 
because you take out a couple of the nodes in a peer-to-peer -peer style. Have, have y'all seen like a network sort of thing? You've got many nodes with many interactions going on between all of them. Take a couple of them out of a decentralized structure, whether that structure is a computing system, a government, the storage of records, etc. You still have backups that can reinforce. Um, and so with peer-to-peer, -peer, tr trying to connect it to uh, artistic production and design, I again see the value in, I think the only way we are going to be able to pursue our dreams is in this kind of sandwich of a couple generations that have been born at, a fine, at an economically inopportune time, is to create peer-to-peer -peer, uh, like uh, compensatory structures for our art and stuff like that. You see that to some degree there's been a success uh, like the body of interaction on Etsy, for example, is peer-to-peer. -peer. It's just that it's controlled by one for-profit company that had a really good idea and created the platform. But um, within decentralization, within the like the tech, the tech field, there are already people building tons of these sort of like trying to create the decentralized art exchange platform, etc. So yeah, I think, and I'm not sure how to them in other than that? Well, I mean, part of the thing is perhaps just in terms of intellectual property and, and how uh, creatives in the past, as well as um, engineers, mm -hmm. uh, have copyrighted ideas or and made uh, money from that. Um, we're talking about a, a different type of system that's starting to surface, which has been around as well, working in parallel. And you, 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 yeah. you talk to that idea of collage or cut and paste or what have you, whether it be code or art, and that also goes for ideas. Yeah, right? absolutely. So this is the exchange of ideas, and yes, in terms of what we're perhaps living through right now is a, is a sea change of how are those things going to shake up? Is it going to be the arbiters of value in, through a centralized function, mm -hmm. or is it going to be more decentralized? Yeah. And I think those tensions, so one of the things you'll see on your research paper essays, which is what is the relationship between left and right politics and central and decentral? That's a very good one. Right? So those are things because it's, it requires no longer, you know, we're used to looking at things as property or, 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 or um, you know, free type of thing, this, this kind of, uh, these tensions that but then we're looking at them in this binary and we're not maybe looking at alternatives that are outside of our purview. Yeah. So because we've been trained to look at the, you know, property, uh, holding property, intellectual property, or copyright and anti-copyright. Well, yeah. is there something else which is actually the way it actually functions that is more real and, and more functional for artists and, and uh, content yeah. makers? I must say, I, I hope after the class ceases, uh, you should uh, hold a discussion group over those questions here sometime, because that one alone, people would talk for like two hours about that. <laughs> and I would say what jumps to mind for me as well, and this is where this becomes, I don't particularly con consider decentralization or decentralism to be a political philosophy. It's a, uh, it's a structural, uh, it's, it's more focused on the structure uh, and moving away from centralization. And since all politics have been centralized, we don't really have a word for that. Like it's not, it's really systemic rather than political ideology because within a decentralist, if we're going utopia within, a, and we've seen how well that works with politics, but just within the, the main intention of it is to have, you can have super right wing, uh, you know, my, what's mine is mine, zero tax little enclaves in there. And then you can have groups that have chosen to share all of their resources, like the sorts of communes we've seen succeed in like, you know, mostly in agrarian communities and stuff like that. But you could start having techno communes of like computer folks who are still splitting all their, you know, like who have an automated system set up in their shared building that uh, does Costco and Amazon runs for them and stuff like like they all split money and then get exactly what they want back out in their daily lives. Um, pretty Jetsons, but I mean we're getting a little Jetsons. So, because I think what we're talking, what you're speaking to perhaps is a the difference between political philosophy, as you say, that is mm -hmm. systemic one, a structural one. Yeah. And we're used to seeing things and taught to see things through system uh, through politics versus systems. 
right? Mm -hmm. and there's, there's a very important aesthetic difference to that and how art and design can function in that context. So yeah. I think this is really important. One of the things that I, maybe after the break is that we can go to is maybe into sort of Q and A's regarding some maybe some really basic stuff. I know there might be people asking in this room, you know, what is cryptocurrency, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, so please, that's that's those things Absolutely. are really important questions. And um, I think this is a great forum. We have a lot of people with a lot of knowledge. And, uh, Absolutely. And I know there's more people joining us at six o'clock. So. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So, so okay, yeah. So what, should we Take a little break and then we can chat about that because also I really am interested in your ideas around like what does a good society look like? Like how could we like what do we want from it? Because the design needs